Today, in this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you exactly how to build the right foundation so that you can profitably scale your business. So if you're doing deals or working on your first one, this will give you actionable insights on how I built a wholesale company to $300,000 per month. So this video is gonna be going through tons of information, but here's what the good operators are going to actually do from this video. One, they're gonna watch the entire thing and they're gonna take notes. But the biggest, most important thing they're gonna do is they're going to go and implement one key thing in their business that will make them more money guaranteed. When I was building my business, there wasn't anything on the internet even close to this. To learn this type of information, I had to spend over $300,000 on information, run a business for several years, spend millions of dollars in commissions and salaries and in marketing. Then I had to go and coach 100 wholesalers on how to grow their business to multiple six and seven figures per year, take all the lessons that I learned and they learned from scaling their businesses, package it all up, and give it to you for free. So I'm gonna be a bit cliche here, but the information in this video and the exercises that I go over would 100% normally be behind a paywall of 10,000, 20,000, even upwards of $30,000 for sure. So obviously I'm giving this information away for free, but my only ask is that you not only take this information and put it in your brain, but you take one thing from this video and implement it in your business so that you can guarantee make more money. Because ultimately the implementation of information is what creates wealth. So if you actually wanna build a business that runs without you, giving you the freedom to travel the world, to live the life that you wanna live, just watch this video and be intentional about your business by implementing one thing in your business that will guaranteed increase your income. With that being said, enjoy the video. All right, so let's dive into how you can go from $0 per month to $300,000 per month. And this all starts basically as a funnel. That's why I've mapped out the five pillars the way that I did is because you have to generate leads first. Once you've generated leads, the next thing we need to do is we need to get appointments on the calendar where we're going giving people offers for their product. After we do that, the third thing we need to do, pillar three, is to build a repeatable sales process that's proven to work, turning B players into A players um, and allowing basically there to be a way to scale yourself out of sales. Sales is the most important part of wholesaling real estate. And if you do it wrong, it, you will not make money. And if you do it right, you'll make a lot of money. So that's why it's really important to have a proven sales process. Number four is we need to automate uh, Dispo and TC. This is going to really put the back end on autopilot because most of the time the entrepreneur is going to be the best uh, salesperson. So we need pillar four to kind of remove the entrepreneur from doing anything other than just sales. And the fifth pillar is going to be actually scaling your business and scaling yourselves out of the day to day. So whether you're just starting out or you're, you know, trying to go from 15, 30, 50 K to a hundred thousand dollars per month, this will be valuable to you because if you haven't done any of these pillars, you won't be able to move and you'll start to hit a ceiling and get stuck maybe at 30 or 50 K uh, per month. And then once you try to scale, you'll just be really unprofitable and make no money. So super important, important to make sure you've done all of these right. And that you have the right channels for you. So let's start with pillar one is building a sustainable lead gen system. So the right thing we need to do, the first thing we need to do is we need to pick the right channel for us. So I'm going to go through the pros and cons of each channel and talk about what I think is the, the goods and the bads of each, and then allow you to kind of pick your channel from there. Once we pick the channel, I'm talking through all the next things. So let's go through cold call. Cold call is a low cost. Um, basically what I mean by that is it's going to cost you 1500 to three K to get a deal. Um, the learning curve is pretty low because you're just talking to sellers. I'm mean, asking them they're interested in selling and doing a basic qualification script. Um, time to ROI. It does take a little while to actually get a deal to convert. You know, usually it's six to nine months for most people I know to like go from doing your first cold call to making your first dollar. Um, obviously like, you know, you might get a contract sooner than that. You might not, but that's on average our cash conversion cycle. Um, then the maintenance, if you have a cold call center, it's a lot of maintenance to maintain performance, right? So you got to manage a lot of people. They got to make sure they're trained all the time. Then KPI, you got to deal with time off, payroll, all kinds of stuff. And it's honestly just a pain. I had a call center with about 30 agents at one point and it really sucked. <laughs> like it's not a fun business to like run. So maintenance is high. Um, now quality of lead, it's low to medium and depends on your qualifications. So like for us, you know, there's anyone who's interested in selling is like, who's a cold call lead. Cold calling is a very viable channel. So don't let it scare you away. The good things about it is that it's low cost and you can be very targeted with the properties you're actually calling and converting as lead direct mail. Um, the cost is medium three to eight K per contract. Um, the learning curve I would say is medium just because of managing inbound leads is different than doing outbound. Um, and also like just the marketing itself, if you're doing it yourself, time to ROI can be quick to medium. So like, you know, you could get a deal on your first drop. So, you know, you spend money and you make money maybe 30 to 60 days later. 
um, all the way up to maybe 120 days later, just because of the uh, seasoning of the mailers itself. Maintenance, low to medium. Once you find a creative and a list that wins, you just keep doing it over and over again. It's not really like a lot of work. And you also don't have a huge volume of leads coming in. So like, you don't have to have a huge staff trained up to uh, handle these inbound call flows. The quality of lead, it can be medium. It can also be a little higher depending on the type of postcard you're sending out. Like if you're sending a check letter with a really discounted price, those leads are going to be pretty qualified, right? But you're not going to get very many of them. So it's like, I think the sweet spot is a medium quality of lead where it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of like 15 to 25 leads um, that come to you of, of being a deal. It might be a little bit less. I have clients that's less. I have clients that's more depending on the quality of leads they have. PPC. So PPC, I think, is like the best option that everyone wants to get to. Uh, the, the one reason most people don't start there is because it's very expensive. So cost is very high, 6 to 12K for a deal. And the reason it goes all the way up to 12K is it depends on what market you're in. Um, and it also depends on your deal size because you're willing to have a 3X ROI, which means if your deal size is 36K, you're willing to spend up to $12,000 for a deal. So people are willing to spend a lot of money to get deals um, done in bigger markets. So just to know that it is... You, you do need to spend a lot of money um, in order to get a deal on PPC um, to get it up and running. The learning curve's high, especially if you're doing the marketing um, yourself. There's just a lot of nuances with Google Ads. So it's going to take you some, some time to learn. And you're going to spend a lot of time to just basically get used to it and then spend money in order to learn. And thus, of course, you're using an agency. Um, actually, like one of the things we're doing right now is uh, in this by the time this video is out, like it'll already be rolling. But... I have a PPC expert in our group um, who is running marketing at a very high level um, and he's doing it for a couple other people, but he's actually teaching a done with you version of how to like do it PPC yourself. And it's in, you know, he's taught me a lot and it's going to be one of the best courses and programs out there. And there's not a lot of people who are actually teaching you how to do it um, in this industry. So <clears throat> unless you're using an agency or having someone teach you exactly what to do, learning curve is extremely high. Uh, time to ROI is also, um, long because you're if you're building from your own website and the reason i say it's like normally these leads convert really quick once you have the website up and running and google respects you and all this kind of stuff but it takes about three months for google to even like recognize you as being in a like a reasonable authority and usually it's about six months between before you'll even start to see like really good leading indicators so that's the expectation is it takes a while so if you have to spend you know let's just say you have to spend you know, 3K a month for like six months just to start to get results. Like you have to spend a good amount of money in order to get this off the ground. Um, the maintenance is really low once it's up and working. So that's why people love it because operationally, it's so easy. The quality leads really high. Um, but if you get to them quick, uh, then you can roll out the, uh, the competition. Um, otherwise, if you're really slow and bad at managing leads, then the competition um, and the quality lead will seem like really low. But the quality leads super high. These people are just extremely motivated. So Basically, where I think most people should start is they should start with cold call or direct mail um, and then scale into something like PPC and really like be able to up their budget in that avenue. So I think that's really important to go over and to talk about here and to just so you know, like the avenue at which you're going to scale your company. After that, um, launching a channel is, you know, to do it right, you have to plan for a six month investment, right? Marketing is not an expense. It's an investment. And every single dollar you spend on marketing is get, during, generating you leads and future revenue that you're going to be able to take advantage of. So it's extremely important to see this as like a static number. Like if you spend 10K a month on marketing, it doesn't mean some months you spend six, some months you spend seven, some months you spend 15. It means you spend 10K every month. And you do that over and over again, and that will breed consistency in your business. So you have to pick a number that you can stick with for a long period of time at least six months. So I write that down because it's going to take you 30 to 90 days to like learn it and get your first deal likely. And then after that, it's going to take you, you know, 30 to 30 to 90 days to close it out, depending on if you're wholesaling or if you're flipping. Um, the big thing, optimizing your lead channels. So again, the way that I, I break this down. So again, step one is to get a sustainable lead gen system. Step two is to convert leads to appointments. And step three is to build a sales process and so on and so on. It's the same thing like as you're trying to make your first dollar in this business and how you're trying to optimize a lead channel is you got to look at it as a funnel. So we literally need to generate leads. That's step one. And then now we need to get, figure out how to get better at converting them, those leads to appointments. So the ways that we do this in our business, and again, the number one thing I see almost all the clients struggling with that we work with is lead to appointment. That's the biggest overarching problem that people struggle with. So the thing we need to do is we need to review every single lead learn what's converting and what's not, 
and we need to do less of what doesn't work and we need to do more of what does work. We need to make sure that there's a lead management process that's 100% dialed in and done perfectly because if the process is not done, then we have no idea if the if the people are good or we don't know what's broken. So the process has to be the, the consistent variable that never changes. And then if things aren't working, it's either because the people aren't doing the process or because they're not trained well enough. So that's why it's so important to have a proven uh, lead management process to convert your leads to appointments. Uh, the other thing is you got to make sure all your leads are in your buy box is another reason why leads don't convert very well to appointments because we, we don't want to give offers to like peace. If we're buying single family houses in a suburban area, we don't want to give offers on land. That's literally the today I talked to these guys and that was their problem is that they just had leads that were just not good, not great in their buy box coming in their system. They're in bad areas where price points are really low. It's impossible to make big. So it's a huge lever in your business if it's wrong. Um, the other thing is converting. So after we convert leads to appointments, now we've fixed, we've gotten leads. We're now converting leads to appointments at the proper rate. The next thing we need to do is we need to convert appointments to contracts. So we need to review every single appointment. And this is anytime you're starting a new lead channel, you have to do this because the only way to know if it's actually working is to make sure you make each stage of the process work. So if I'm converting appointments to contracts, I need to review every single appointment. I need to make sure the pipeline's managed correctly for every single lead. So like there needs to be motivation notes. Why was this not signed? And what's my next action of how am I going to get it signed? So that way you can quickly at a glance, see all the, the status of all the leads. And it's going to allow you to basically dial in what's going on in the sales process. So again, another thing that's really important, we got to have a dialed in sales process and we got to train further on it, advanced objection handling. Um, there's different objections sometimes based on lead sources and ways that uh, personalities are for different leads. So like direct mail, a lot of times it might be a little bit older, a little bit less tech savvy person compared to someone PPC. PPC is going to be maybe a little bit more savvy, maybe a little bit more tech oriented, um, that kind of thing, right? Um, so it's really important to know and be able to learn from each lead of why they do or don't convert and then to dial that in. Again, super important. We got to have the process dialed in so we know if the process works or doesn't or if it's the people that aren't good at the process yet and need more training. Then once we get contracts, now we need to convert them to sold deals. So confirm the deal will monetize. Um, if we do know that these deals are going to monetize, for sure, we found buyers and they're set to close and all the titles issues are good, payoff solid, then we can decide to increase the budget accordingly. And But we're not going to do that until either depending on where our cash position's at, until we either have projected really good ROIs and we're comfortable with spending more money, or we've made money back from this marketing channel that we can bankroll the increase in marketing. And remember, when you increase your marketing budget, you need to be able to increase that for at least three months because that's how long it's going to take for those results to start to compound, right? So anytime you increase your marketing budget, the main thing you need to keep an eye on is you got to keep an eye on the cost per appointment to make sure that that stays the same amount within your KPI. So like if you can only pay $2,000 for an appointment, if your cost per appointment and that, that's to stay profitable in your business, then you can't pay more than $2,000. Otherwise you're going to be unprofitable. So you got to monitor that every week as you scale the budget, because if your cost goes too high, then that's how you lose money. That's how you become unprofitable. So that's, that's the key to scaling and getting more leads. So let's go into number four. Um, what KPIs do I track for each channel? So cold call. Um, I'll let you guys just pause it here. But basically the number one KPI that we got to track is hours work per lead. And this needs to be between two and three. Uh, my team was at two and a half. I've seen teams that are really good at US-based callers that are below two. But three is the max, the worst uh, time, worst that they can have. That really results in about three leads. And then you can look at the rest of these. The leading metric I track on and care about is uh, connects per hour per dialer. And I want them to be 10 to 15 connects per hour per person. Um, so if they dial for an hour, they need to connect with to 10 to 15 people. For mailers, just looking for a response rate um, and the main main metrics like cost per appointment, cost per acquisition, ROI, all those things are the main metrics for every marketing channel. Um, so you need to make sure your response rate's in between here. Uh, for PPC, uh, you're going to look basically like how how is my how many clicks am I getting? Am I winning the right amount of impressions per click for different campaigns? But what you're paying for is you're paying for clicks. So you really care about your click to conversion rate. Um, I think the baseline based on talking to other professionals is somewhere around 30% uh, click to convert. Um, but I know that, uh, one of the guys that we're working with in level up his page, is like 41%. So it converts a fair amount better. Uh, and because you pay for clicks, the conversions, a lead. So your leads are a lot cheaper if your click to conversions higher. 
Um, so it's really important to monitor that because that just means you need to change your landing page up and that kind of stuff. The other key metrics you have to track are these. Uh, the biggest one that most people don't know is net lead. Net lead is just going to be someone who's qualified. Um, that basically, and what I mean by qualified is they, they have a property that they're willing to sell and that we talk to them about selling that property. That's a net lead. It's basically a qualified person. It doesn't mean they're motivated. It just means that they have a property that they'd be willing to sell. And everything else is very self-explanatory. You just need to track these numbers so that you understand how the business is working so that you know how to scale it and make good decisions. Because the level of your decisions is going to directly relate to the amount of money you make. All right, so scaling marketing spend. I talked about this very briefly, but don't start, don't start a second marketing channel until you're spending at least 20K a month on one channel. I honestly think that you can go higher on some channels like PPC. I have a client who's going to scale to about 35K a month on PPC before opening up another channel. And that's just because that channel is super scalable and bigger MSAs, right? So I don't want to see someone who has three marketing channels where they spend $3,000 on each. That's just a complete waste of money and adds way too complex, too much complexity to like really allow you to scale. So pick one that works the best. Um, the second thing is scale marketing up or down depending on your ROAS. So basically, if you have more than a 4X ROI on cold call, you should spend more money until you have a 4X or lower. When you have a 4X, you should hold steady. When you have less than a 4X, you should spend less because 4X is the, the ideal, like lowest ROI you're okay with, but, but you're still profitable at 4X, at least until you're 100K a month, then you have to increase cost structure, but don't worry about all that. For right now, if you're at 4X, spend more money. If you're above 4X, spend more money. And if you're below it, spend less money. If you're at it, stay the same. Direct mail, 3.5X or more, spend money. 3.5X or equal, stay the same. 3.5X or less, spend less. Um, also a caveat to this is when I say spend less, you really need to look at your conversions from lead to net lead, net lead to appointment, appointment to offer, offer to contract. You need to see what's not at industry standard. So if you're converting leads to net leads at like 20%, which means you're not getting in contact with like anyone, then like that's your issue of like why your ROI is so low. Or maybe if your close rate's like 5% when it really should be like 15 or 20 or 30 um, that's a huge issue. And the fact that you're not, the fact that you're making money from marketing is still really impressive. Um, so you got to make sure you look at these things, these, these numbers, and you're part of a community that tells you what the baselines are. If you follow me on any, any platforms, it's different for every lead channel, but if you, if you follow me on any platforms and want to know what the baselines are, just shoot, shoot me a DM and I'll send you over all the baselines for every single lead channel. Um, another huge one that I see that's always, um, a, not always, but a lot of times a very big issue is average deal size. If your average deal size is less than, Twenty twenty thousand dollars is going to be almost impossible to scale to hundred k per month. It's so challenging to scale if you're doing less than twenty k deal. So that's that's really the main one that I see is like a huge. That's the leverage piece in this business. That and people um, is the deal size. You got to do big deals. All right, PPC. If you're above a three x ROI on PPC, scale. If you're below it, spend less. If you're at it, keep spending the same. What you always want to be doing is looking for ways in your business of how you can increase your ROI or, or your ROAS, your return on ad spend. Because if you can increase your return on ad spend, then you're going to make more money. Um, so you only, you know, if, if you want to make 50% of your business be profit, 50% of your revenue be profit, you only, you get to spend 25% on marketing. Well, you only got another 25% of your total revenue to spend on stuff. And that goes quick. So you got to make sure your ROI is as high as it possibly can be and then spend more money accordingly. The other, the next part is scale off cost per appointment. So I talked about this briefly. It's like, know what your cost per appointment, like the maximum you can spend. And because we're in the biz of buying appointments and not leads. So here's how we establish the, the maximum cost per appointment is we take our average deal size, we divide that by a target ROI, and that gives us the most we can pay for a deal. Then we divide that by the number of appointments or offers or whatever you want to make your metric off of. And that gives us our maximum um, cost per appointment. So here's an example. 30K average deal size divided by 5X ROI equals a $6,000 cost per deal. That's how much we're willing to pay. So $6,000 divided by 10, because let's just say it takes us 10 appointments to get a deal. Then I know the most I can pay is $600 per appointment. So what I want to do is I want to do that for everything and search for diminishing return. So here's an example. So if I know I can only pay $600 per appointment um, and that's where I'm at, then I have to basically always be underneath $600. Otherwise, I'm going to go over 5X ROI. So 
that's that's critical. You have to know this number. You have to know your max. And it's different for every lead channel as well, just so you know. Search for diminishing return. This is the last part. And this is this is a little bit more complex, but it's gonna be really important for you, those of you who are spending more than five or ten thousand dollars a month in marketing. So here's scenario one is you spend five K a month on marketing and that generates you 10 appointments. That's five hundred dollars per appointment. Let's you're and you're like, man, I'm making a lot of money. Let's let's keep let's increase this. Well, what happens is I go from spending 5K to I spend 8K a month now. And all that happened is I got an extra two appointments per month. So for $3,000, I got two appointments. If the most I'm willing to spend for an appointment is $600, was it worth it for me to spend 3K to get two more appointments? No, of course not. That's not profitable. So something I did there was wrong. And one of my numbers somewhere in the, in the manufacturing line in the funnel, things got screwed up. And this caused me to see a huge diminishing return. So maybe it was the speed at which your lead managers called back the leads. Maybe it was, you know, the new guy you're training. Maybe it was um, the fact that you ran a, a new marketing campaign with a letter that wasn't very good or a new list or whatever it is. But you wasted three grand, basically. You didn't waste it. You didn't spend it very effectively. So you need to figure out how to either make this three grand be worth something or you need to spend it in a different place because sometimes you will see a diminishing return, but most time it's operational. And so that's marketing. That's how we're going to build a sustainable lead gen system is by doing all those things. Pillar two, now that we have a sustainable lead gen system, um, we need to, and we're generating leads at a consistent basis, we need to learn how to convert these leads to appointments at a high level. And this is going to be more focused on the sales process of actually how to do this. So let's dive into this. So the importance of sales process and lead management um, is we have to follow the process perfectly. If we don't follow the process perfectly, then we don't know what's actually right or we don't know what's actually wrong. So there's no way to scale if there's no process and there's no way to teach people how to do something if there is no repeatable way of how to do it because it's just going to be like a million different... People are just going to get so so confused. It's not going to work. Um, basically, the other key thing that helps a lot, as I can just highlight, is the acquisition person um, basically is going to have a seller sent to them at the same state in the sales process every time. So that way, like the lead managers or that appointment setting conversation, you won't say too much, you won't say too little, you'll say just the right amount to where the acquisition managers know exactly where they're picking up with the seller and the seller's in the right spot um, in the in the selling process for us to speak with. So let's go through this document. Um, I created this document basically with our sales, uh, our sales process documented here. And I wanna share this with you. So basically what this is, this is a flow chart. Um, and it starts and ends in a couple places. So it starts whenever we have the new lead answers and we do our what we call this call. Once the diagnosis call is over, that means we set the appointment and then now we would start the offer call. Once we do the offer call, we hopefully get the contract signed or they move to a follow-up and we keep working through the process. So big things here, this is basically the script just broken out. Um, and you can, and I'll show you the script as well, but you can basically, this is the main parts of the script that are broken out. So like, we always know that we need to hit the intro, then we need to set expectations, we need to go to condition, then timeline, then confirm roadblocks and motivation, and et cetera. And then based on what the motivation is, we decide to set it or not to set it. And if we do set it, then there's some basic um, assumptions of what needs to happen next. So like it sends out automated replies so the seller will show up to the appointment and all that kind of stuff. Then once they're there, you know, it starts the offer call on the same exact process, same intro, same expectations, which is what we call setting the stage. We address the same roadblocks. We state the motivation. We set up the offer. We give the offer. Then we negotiate. We have a negotiation process where we give a price too low reply. That's what you know the seller says. That's too low. And then we have a certain reply there. We give a couple more rebuttals on price. If it's accepted, then great. We send over the document sign. If not, we're going to go into what we call the MLS uh, pitch. And then is that accepted? Great. Okay, awesome. Send over the document sign and start that process. If not, we just move to a follow-up. And we're going to repeat this process over and over again. But this is how we guarantee that we don't send out. And this next part is actually really critical. It's how we guarantee that we don't just send out DocuSigns and uh, just they never come back, right? So we go over and do a contract call. We have a process for that where we prep the document. We do the small talk while we're prepping the document so they don't get cold feet. Then we post close right before sending the document. Then we segue into reviewing and we go over each section. And then we basically set expectations for what happens after they sign the document. Um, after they sign it and then now the contract's signed and now we got a deal that's moved through at the right pace, the right expectations that will not cause any hiccups on the back end when we actually close this deal. Um, 
So it's super critical. You'll have, you know, it's super critical that you actually do these things. Um, and a couple, I want to show you this. This is the biggest thing that I've noticed in people's offer calls that who don't close very well. Um, and it's because most of their offer calls are really short. Uh, the average for all of our offer calls, uh, we did this like two years ago where we made it one of our rocks, it, is they needed to all average more than 30 minutes. So that's really critical. Longer than 30 minutes for our average offer call is the number that we've seen to like really increase our close rate. It means we have a lot of quality conversations with people and we're getting deep into motivation. Uh, most sellers we lock up are after a couple, two or three, or a lot of follow-up, but multiple 60-minute conversations. So lots of time spent with people who have motivation, because if you just kind of brush through it and don't dive into their motivation, their situation, they don't really feel understood and they're, they're going to be a lot less likely to sign. So that's the sales process and we have scripts and all kinds of stuff. Um, I'll show you the diagnosis script because that's the one that we're talking about right now. Because if we want to convert leads to appointments, then it's about having a good script that your lead manager or your acquisition manager can qualify people for. So here's the intro. Um, you can pause it. I'm just going to scroll through. I'm not going to read the script to you, but basically the intro is important. So just, it's just intro how we start all the calls because you don't call, you know, some big uh, electricity company and they, they don't have, they all have a script. They all have a process, right? Then we set expectations for how the call is going to go so that we all have an upfront agreement, we go through conditions. So we always have the same information about every property that comes through. So we know how to comp properties. Then we have timelines. So we know, you know, this gives us some hidden motivation, potentially some stuff. Uh, then we confirm roadblocks, make sure there's no decision makers. That way we always have that information. So an acquisition manager sees that there's no notes on decision makers, then they know that we're there dealing with the main person. Um, obviously motivation notes, you know, we're just going to find out basically if they have motivation on this call. And if they do, then we'll set, we'll give them an offer, find out what price they want. Um, and then we'll set them to an appointment. And the same things are said every single call. And it's really important to have this standardized because it takes the training time from like months and months and months to literally like two weeks. So that's why you got to have a script. That's why you got to have a sales process. Um, the next thing too is like not only what do you say to sellers and how do you say it and like when do you say it and you know all this sales talk, but also the organization of your CRM. So if you don't, you know, I've seen this with so many people, but once you like change the way the, the leads are structured in the CRM, you can take your team and make them way more productive by using the 80-20 principle. So that's what we really focus on with our team is we, we're, we're searching this huge haystack for like a needle and that needle is an appointment. That's what we're trying to do. Take the, the hay is all these leads and there's one needle in there, which is a motivated lead. And the way that we shrink the haystack, make there be less hay, but keep the same amount of needles in there. So we, we grab more needles each time we go in there um, is by focusing on the, the way that we structure our CRM. So we're calling the best leads the most frequently. So here's the status as we use is we have new leads, which there's only new leads. This is, means that they've never been touched. No one's ever called them. This does not stack up. There's never more than like five or 10 leads in there, depending on how many leads have been sent immediately. But they new leads get called in less than five minutes. That's the rule. Call them as fast as possible. Then we have working leads, which that's another status. That basically means we called them, but we never had a conversation with them. So they didn't convert to a net lead. Um, they didn't like answer us or maybe it was like, hey, call me back. I'm busy. And then they just kind of hang up and that's kind of it. Um, that's a working lead. Someone who we, we haven't spoke to at all. A cold follow-up is someone who wants to start the selling process in 90 days. A warm follow-up is 31 to 90 days. Um, it also could just like be someone who's not extremely cold that they might sell down the road, but they're not like really like that hot. Um, it's kind of like a differentiator. And then hot follow-ups is less than 30 days to start the selling process and they should be an appointment, but for whatever reason they're not, maybe it's decision makers, maybe they need to talk to their accountant, whatever it is, right? Um, then you have dead leads, um, hostile, sold the house, wrong number, not in the buy box, et cetera. Then we have appointment set, basically has motivation to sell um, or a discounted price. Um, and they want to start the selling process in the next 30 days. So they're basically ready to, ready to hear an offer. They're, they're like legit ready. This is where the 80-20 comes in. So like this is how we set the CRM up. So these are the lead statuses. It's really important to have this. Every lead needs to have a lead status and needs to be in the right bucket. It's super critical because if they're not in the right bucket, there's no way you can manage the pipeline. Um, the fourth thing right here, lead management workflow. So again, focus on the 80-20. It's the reason we built this is the way that we did is because we realized that the, the, the actually like what all transpired all of this is we had two lead managers who were setting, I think it was like 25 appointments a week, which was pretty good at the time. Um, we were pretty happy with that. Then we're like, oh, dude, we're going to make so much money. Let's hire two more. So we had four total lead managers. And what happened was instead of getting 25 appointments a week, we started getting like 15. And that's because we split all the leads up equally between all the people. 
And what we realized is that each lead manager had different skill sets, which is like looking back on this now, it's like, duh, it's so obvious. But we took all the best leads from the best people and gave them to like horrible people. So like the best people had a smaller area of leads to go after that were less motivated. And the people who weren't that good had the same amount of opportunities as the people who are really good, which is just not fair for anyone, including the business. So what we did was we created these list views and we made it to where there's no lead ownership in the system other than hot follow-ups. That's it. So basically the list views we create is new leads. So everyone knew first person there as fast as possible is going to get it. One caveat to this is do not have badly managers getting inbound leads. You have to have the best person acquisitions managers, typically acquisition managers or really, really good and really, really seasoned lead managers taking inbound leads because that first phone call with an inbound prospect has to be incredible. Otherwise you will never convert it to an appointment. Um, as far as outbound, it's, it's a little, it matters less for sure. Uh, but new leads call them immediately. This is just all people who've, uh, who are new status, new working zero to seven, zero to seven days, seven to 30 days and working 31 plus. What does this mean? Basically this means that these are leads that we've been, that have been in our system um, that we've never spoken with or had a meeting, had a conversation. And these are zero to seven days old, meaning that they're new ish leads that we've never spoken to. These are ones that are seven to 30 days old, meaning they're like kind of medium age. And then working 31 plus days means that they're really old. We call these leads like three times a day for the first seven days. And we just pound this list. So by the time they get all the way down here to 31 days, they've never answered. And we've called them like a hundred times at this point. So basically what this means is that this list is going to be way better than this list if you're going to call it. So we call these way more frequently than we would call this list. And that's how you organize the people you've never spoken to so that you can maximize your time and your efficiency. Then hot follow-ups is obviously, you know, people who should be an appointment. We mainly follow up with these people. Warm follow-ups every two weeks we're following up with them, but basically I already talked about it, but just warm follow-up people. Cold follow-ups, we talk to these people every 30 days. This becomes a huge list for us. And so we filter it out by like location, bedrooms, baths, things that like basically help us make a better list. And then pending appointments. These are people who like no showed the appointment because we're virtual. Um, and these people this is like an amazing list as well. It's kind of like working, but we're, we know these people are appointment criteria. They just never showed up, never answered. So we're going to call this list three times a day as well. Super good. The list calling priority for a lead manager, this is like how they determine how to structure their day is anytime there's a new lead, they call it no matter what, five minutes or less, call it within less than a minute, it's the best you can do. Um, basically after that hot follow-ups, they're gonna have random hot follow-up uh, times to call them like scheduled throughout the day. So these two are the most important. Then we got pending appointments is the next most important because you're just gonna go through that list and then do it again later in the day and then do it again later in the day. Um, and it's most important because we know those people are motivated to sell working zero to seven. This is where we set most of our appointments from. And that's why it's just the best list. Um, so we're going to call this at least two times, ideally three times through a day. Um, warm follow-ups is next, blah, 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 uh, working seven plus after, you know, a lot of times, like if you have a ton of leads, your guys won't get through, uh, past these two uh, lists of calling. But if you have less leads then they'll get through all this. And then you can just call cold follow-ups and working 30 plus. Um, they both kind of aren't that good. So anyways, if there aren't enough leads, feel free to have your lead managers like rotate between maybe like these two sections and like cold opportunity follow-ups or maybe calling like um, some some old people you've given offers to and like trying to reset this. That's really uh, critical. Uh, just like kind of like move them around. This, there's this whole term of like CRM marketing that I'm not going to get into, but you just basically want to put your... Think of like lead managers as cold callers for your CRMs. So you want to put them in the best place to go and fish for, for motivated sellers in your system. And that's why we built it. Number five, what KPIs do we track for lead management? So on a daily basis, we're tracking conversations, which is basically just like a connection. Like, do we connect to a real person? So we know our connect rate to know if our phone numbers are spam or not. Um, then appointments set. Um, and then that's, that's it. So basically the metrics for a performing lead manager are going to be two appointments set per day. Um, conversations per day should be about 15 to 20, depends on the skill of the rep. Uh, basically it's typically between 10 to 15% of those are going to be set to them. So somewhere between, uh, that's why I say 15 to 20, because it just depends on how many conversations people can convert to appointments based on how good they are. Then calls per day, hundred, hundred per day. And those are the metrics. That you need. So that's how you, we convert more leads to appointments by having a sales process, 
organized CRM and like scripts and all that kind of stuff dialed in. You got to have this dialed in in order to actually convert at a high level. And the biggest thing is if you're doing PPC and all these other um, inbound channels, you've got to call these leads so fast because if you wait longer than, I think the math is three minutes, then it's basically irrelevant for you to even do this lead channel. Because what's going to happen is the psychology of the seller is going to change. And then they're going to tell you, yeah, I'm not interested because they already talked to Joe Schmo who gave them an offer to buy their house. And they're like, yeah, I love that guy. I want to sell my house to him. So of course they're going to tell you, I'm not interested. And I changed my mind. That's, that's, that's what happened. They didn't actually change their mind. You just didn't get to them first. So you got to be really fast and you got to be really good on that first call. And then you neglect or neglect or mitigate all other competition. All right. Pillar three, building a repeatable sales process. So we talked about converting leads to appointments. That's, that's a sales process itself, but I really want to go over the acquisitions process. Cause I know I went over the whole process on this, uh, on this flow chart. Um, but I want to show you the offer call script and some of the other things that we do, um, to organize the back end, like the post offer side of the CRM, as well as to convert more opportunity. So big, big thing here, just so you know, is about 60 to 70% of all your revenue should be new, like newer leads that aren't follow-ups, like less than 30 days old. And then the other portion of your revenue, so 30 to 40% of your revenue should all be from follow-ups, people who are more than a month long after being a lead in your system. So like the way that I deem it as being a follow-up is um, a follow-up for, uh, you know, a, a, an acquisitions person is if it's been more than a month since we gave them an offer. Um, but you can just use the general rule of thumb of a month old of a lead. After a month old of being a lead, you are a follow-up revenue. So that's, that's how I do it. So... Um, importance for this offer call sales process is we got to follow the process perfectly. I've said that like 10 times in this video, because if you don't know, follow the process perfectly, then you're not going to know whether it's the process, the people, or you're not going to know what to train on. It's not going to be scalable. So we got to have a process so we can scale it. Um, and it's going to be repeatable. We also like the question I would ask is how the hell are you going to hire someone without a repeatable process? And the, the answer is you can try, but they're not going to, you're going to think they suck. <laughs> that's, that's the reality of it. Hiring, like literally, okay, we I literally had a guy who joined uh, Level Up maybe like two months ago. It was a month and a half ago. And he is like a really, really great closer. And his close rate was only like 15% when we looked at his numbers. And I asked him, I said, he's like, he's like, dude, I can't believe I, my close rate is only 35%. And I asked him, I said, dude, how are you following a sales process right now? And he goes, no, I haven't been following a, the sales process I've written out. I've just kind of been winging it. And then he's like, I need to do that. Dude starts following the sales process. Three weeks later, his closing rate is 35%. So literally doubled his close rate and he's a great closer. So that is to me, the power of a sales process is able to take someone, it's able to take an A player to be a B player with no sales process. And it's able to take a B player and turn them into an A player with a sales process. So super critical there. Um, basically the process that you, we built out. So this thing right here, solves about 70% of all the issues. So it's like this core thing that solves most stuff. It's like the backbone for how we do the business. And then the other 30% is where advanced training comes in from the manager. So it's really important to be able to differentiate between like, what's just like the core way that we work, work the business perfectly. And then when things go wrong, let's just say there's an objection in a sales script, you're not going to make a million different like uh, exception paths or, you know, rules around this. You're just going to do um, advanced training and have like, you know, a list of all the objections with the way that you rebuttal to them. And that's how you do it. So with that being said, let's go right into the offer call script. So offer call script, it's going to be very simple. On the left here, you'll see the intro, the set the stage, the address, the roadblock, state the motivation, get set the offer up, give the price, negotiate, MLS pitch, post offer objections. And I have a one down here, manager pitch, which you guys can go read into. I'm not going to go deep on, on this in this video because it's, it's a little bit more advanced. Um, and it's just like something that people, you know, it's kind of like, you can see it's 15K profit instead of a 35K profit. Basically, it's like one time when we, when we used to do terms offers and creative finance and all this kind of stuff as like a backup to our cash offer, what happened is we, our close rate dropped because our closers would just like default to the easiest method to pay the sellers the most instead of negotiating harder. Um, and like, we were like, oh, for 120 creative offers, which obviously shows how good we were at that. Um, and then, but then like our close rate for our cash offers also dropped because we were giving them these other options and confusing them. So like, I don't want anyone to do this right now, but it is on here in case you ever do want to explore it and see what it's all about.
But it starts with the intro. Um, then we set the stage. So we tell them how this dance is going to And we get their buy-in that they're okay with that. Then we go through and address roadblocks, make sure all the people of input and all the decision makers are present. If they are, we move forward to stating the motivation that the lead manager talked to, to us about. And then we dive into this. We want to stay here for a long time. This is where that 30 minute phone call like comes comes to fruition. Like you need to understand their circumstances and their goals very, very clearly and like why they want to basically make that transition in their life and what that does for them in a picture perfect scenario. If you can understand that and get super deep, like, you know, we're talking like 20, 30 minutes of having a conversation here in this realm so that we know exactly what they actually want to do so that when we make them an offer, they feel really understood and they feel like we can solve their problem. We want that 100% certainty that we're the people who can solve their problem. And this is how we gain it is through uh, basically empathizing with their situation and to the, in their motivation state and all that kind of stuff and undercover it. So once we do that, we're going to set up the offer. Um, basically, we're just going to prep it and then we're going to give them an offer. So we have like a, a MAO sheet and basically we have three prices um, on there. Um, let me see if I have that here. I can show you guys. Um, it's over here. Here we go. Basically, the way that this works is we have um, three prices. So we have our first offer max, which you can see right here is 40K less than our no access MAO. And let me explain that to you. So basically, the way that we do this is we, we go off market price because we're listing everything on the MLS and we take out all the fees and everything that would be associated with us selling the property. And then we take out our profit um, for if it was access and our profit for no access. And basically what that means Access is if we're going to list it on the MLS and do like a novation and sell it to a retail buyer um, without owning it. And then no access is if we're going to wholesale it. Um, this is also pretty much a wholesale offer too, but we never wholesale because why would we wholesale for 20K when we can wholesale? For, doesn't make any sense to me. So that's what our pr primary strategy is here is to wholesale um, our first offer. And this just means being, no access means we need to get in two times the price. Then we have our first offer max, which you can see in this scenario is 30K lower. But we, we went to 40K lower. So you can do whatever you want. Um, the lower you start, the lower you'll finish. Um, but to go lower at the initial piece, you have to have a better relationship with the actual seller. Um, so if you just brush across the motivation point, so if you just go through this in five minutes and you offer them 40K less than your no access offer, they're probably just going to hang up on you. So you have to earn the right to offer them less. So that's, that's your job. Um, basically, we give them the offer with a no, uh, 40K less than no access MAO. And you can go lower than that, of course, if you want, if you feel like you can go lower, um, but that's like the maximum. And then basically we go through and we negotiate. So price too low, we sigh. Yeah, you know, just off the record, what were you hoping for at least? Something like that, right? And they're going to be like, well, whatever, whatever. And then we're going to give them a couple of price rebuttals. If this doesn't, obviously like each price rebuttal, um, you know, like even if I came up to X, that probably still wouldn't be enough. Um, we're going to, even if they, you know, at this point, we're usually going to have a conversation about it and like what their, how this equi relates to their motivation and their picture perfect scenario and blah, 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 blah. Um, and then we're going to do it again. And then um, after we've done it basically enough to where we're like, yeah, there's no way they're coming lower, which is one to two times. Then we're going to go into the MLS pitch because we've usually uncovered their best price at this or their better price, not necessarily guaranteed to be their best price, but they're, they're one of their best prices. We're going to come up to the MLS pitch. And then this is where, uh, this is our access MAO and that's here. And basically you can see how that's about 45 K more. It, this is also a really expensive house, but, um, you know, most stuff we deal with is in like a 350 range. Let me just put that here. Um, so you can see it's, it's about 40 K 40 K. Yeah. It's a pretty good amount. 40 K more to, to do the access amount. And then we go into the pitch here and basically this is just going to be, um, telling them that we can get them more money if they get our flexible with us on access to the property. And the reason why we go with it being the access pitch is because that's all they need to do in order for this to happen. Is they just need to be flexible with us on access. And if they can do that, then we can get them the extra $30,000 that they want. Otherwise, um, you know, we have to be at the lower price. And then we just go through like all this different stuff and you can read it um, and go through these different things. Um, I also, in this document, there are, um, there are, live calls uh, for qualifying or disqualifying, offer calls and contract calls and all that kind of stuff here. So you'll be able to see all that stuff um, through the sales process video. So that's, where am I at here? That's why the offer call script is so important.
because it's just going to maximize the ability for you to step your offers up the right way. Um, and it's going to create something that's systemized for people to not only give offers and go into motivation, but also to negotiate and get deep. Then of course, there's all these post offer objections that you can read through. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's tons of those. So that's the offer process. That's the offer script. And that's how we train people in 30 days or less to get one contract signed when they're completely new to our program. So it's really important that you do that because your team is going to get ramped up way faster and perform way higher. All right. Organizing the opportunity section of your CRM. So this is super important. It's going to be similar to what we did on the actual um, other side it, uh, with the leads section. Um, basically what we're going to do here is we're going to have a couple uh, different things. We're going to have pending appointments as like a new stage. So that's going to be basically people who no show us. Then we're going to have appointments set. Um, this is going to be calls that are set up on the calendar for the future. We're going to have cold offer follow-ups, which these are going to be people who are just not motivated. They don't want to sell for more than 90 days. They're just kind of like cold. Um, we have warm offer follow-ups, which are people who will not sign the contract uh, for the next 30 to 90 days. And this is all of an estimate. It's not like we're asking them, hey, when are you going to sign this contract? You know, we don't do that. Um, and then the hot offer follow-ups, people who we think will sign in the next 30. And then negotiation is people who will likely sign in the next seven. Um, and then we have dead, which is hostile, sold deal, wrong number, not in buy box. We have contract signed. Um, we have contract signed, which these are just things that get signed with a seller. Um, and then we roll this over into uh, actually into like dispo. So we have a couple of dispo statuses that happen after the contract gets signed with a seller. So we have pending marketing, which is like a dispo status. Um, and then we basically are here, we're creating the marketing materials to get the property live. Then we have the walkthrough period, which is this, the property is being marketed, but there is no buyer. So it means people are walking to the property. Then we have sign with buyer. And this just means sign contract with the buyer. Maybe it's an assignment. Maybe it's a B2C, like purchase and sale. Whatever it is, it's something where we have a buyer in place. And then sold deal means we close to make money. Cancel contract means we cancel the contract with the seller. So th this is a lot. But the main ones for acquisitions that I want to focus on are going to be these uh, eight right here. Um, so we'll talk about those in just a second. So those are the statuses that you need, right? The list that you need to build are going to be your appointment set so you can just see what's on the calendar, your pending appointments so you know what no-shows are there, uh, your cold follow-ups, warm follow-ups, hot follow-ups, negotiations, all that kind of stuff. And then now we have an acquisition manager list calling priority, which is going to be really, really critical so that, again, they know what their daily flow looks like, right? So they're going to hit appointment set whenever it's on the calendar. It's going to be random. And they have their negotiations, which are going to be like scheduled follow-up calls, right? We're going to be talking to negotiations like most days, like they should not go more than three days for sure without talking to negotiation uh, max. Then you have new inbound seller leads. So like I talked about earlier, how the acquisition manager needs to handle inbound seller leads. You have to do that here in this scenario. Like they have to be on those flows and be number one on the flow. Then you have hot follow-ups. That's going to be like, there. this is the 30 days uh, or less sell time frame. We want to go no longer than seven days without talking to pe these people. Uh, pending appointments. So those are also going to probably be on the calendar as well. Most of them are going to be. We have pending appointments, which are, again, no-shows. So they're just going to rip through these um, a few times a day. They have the warm follow-ups, uh, which these are contact every 14 days, no no more, no more, less frequent than 14 days. And then cold follow-ups, which are you know roughly every 30 days. But uh, sometimes those get overwhelmed and we'll have the lead manager. Or we'll put these types of leads back into marketing or something. Um, then after that, the fourth thing is our sales training. So let's, let's just like get a lay of the land right here. So we have established a sales process for the diagnosis process. We've established a sales process for the acquisitions process for the offer call process. And then now what we need to do is we need to make sure we train our acquisitions people the best way possible. Because again, the lifeblood of your wholesale real estate business is sales. So if you can't do that well, then you're going to really struggle. So acquisition and sales training. Most time, this when a sales team's not performing, it's not because the training itself is bad. It's because there's just none happening. So at the minimum, we need to train our sales team three times per week. Ideally, it's five times per week until they get really up, up to speed and they're rocking and rolling. But three times per week at the minimum where we do role plays, um, focus on the process and focus on advanced scenarios. Those are the two types of role plays we can do. And I like to combine them both together. Um, you know, it just depends on like what we're doing. I like to really combine the advanced scenario role plays with live call reviews because the live call reviews allow us to go really deep on advanced techniques that basically didn't quite work in the call. 
and it, it it's like any you're role playing anything in the call that was like a hypothetical. So let's just say we the call didn't get the best uh, result that we want. So if we didn't sign the contract, and maybe there was this one pivot point in the conversation where it's like, you know, you went this route, but I think if you went this route, like I think that you could have had a different outcome. Then in that scenario, we would want to role play that alternative output outcome and see how that takes us to the result. And so that's how we can focus on much more advanced scenarios and advanced objections and all that kind of stuff while combining live call reviews with role plays. And, and most of you know this inherently, you just need to put it on the calendar and actually do it. That's like the biggest thing is like, you know how to do sales. You should be able to teach it from your head to other people and force yourself to do it at least three times a week. That's going to take your acquisitions team way, way, way farther than if they just did it on their own. Another piece of this too, is if you're doing acquisitions yourself, you need to be doing the same things, whether you're role playing with other individuals who are in a community um, or on your same level or your friends or whatever. You also need to be doing live call reviews as well. If you can do this with someone else who you know, who's at, at your level or above your level, that's also doing sales calls all the time, then like this is going to push you both way farther forward than if you didn't do this. Because professional athletes don't stop like watching film or start practicing once they make it to the pros. Like they just, they, they do it more actually. So if you want to be great, you got to make sure you do these things for yourself as well as for your team. So um, what KPIs do I track to see if my acquisitions team is performing or even if I'm performing as acquisition manager? So you want to track your calls, your offers, your contracts, um, and that's on a daily basis. Those are going to give you really good understanding of like how much activity people are doing, how many offers are people making, and then what's the conversion on their offers and contracts. So the metrics we track on a daily basis, are they need to make one contract, they need to sign one contract per day. Most of the time that's not going to happen, right? So if they don't sign one per day, they need to make three offers. Um, and for each offer that they miss, they need to make 25 outbound calls per offer met. And this is going to basically make sure that they're doing the things that are required to get the result that we want. So they're either getting a contract signed, don't care what they do the rest of the day if they get a contract signed. So it means you had a good day. Obviously, you know, you need to make sure you call your your hot and negotiations and all that kind of stuff <laughs> um, because that's just like, you got to nurture those the right way. Um, but there's not going to be any questions asked if you get a contract signed. Everything else doesn't apply. So we're always focused on the result and it's the most important thing is the result. So that's going to be how we build a repeatable sales process and we got to install that in our business. Pillar four. Um, so now that we have a sustainable lead gen system, we're converting leads to appointments at the rate that should be converted. We're building and have built a repeatable sales process where that we can close seller leads at a high rate, um, a very profitable rate that makes us a lot of money that generates us a lot of free cash flow. Now we're getting overwhelmed with Dispo and TC. So at this point, we are have we probably have like five, six, seven, eight contracts under under the belt, and we're neglecting offers. And we're getting burned out on giving offers, but we're still the best person suited for that job. The reason we're burned out is because we're doing too many things. So the next thing we need to do is we need to automate Dispo and TC and get that fully off the plate of the entrepreneur. Because for almost like 99.99% of people I know who are wholesale entrepreneurs are the best at sales in their organization, regardless of who they are. Um, so that's why we need to implement and delegate Dispo and TC. So... These are typically admin tasks that take people away from their zone, zone of genius. Um, and then a lot of times what I see is wholesalers take the easy dispo route and leave a lot of money on the table because they're lazy. It's like I, another guy I was just talking to the other day, he disposed with New Western, which, hey, to start off with, that's okay. It's very, it's like an easy button. But like he, he left $300,000 on the table in one year of fully net profit. So... I mean, is it worth it to build out a Dispo team for $300,000? For most people, that answer to that question is going to be, of course. So you got to do that. Um, also, you just, <laughs> I hear this all the time. This is another really funny one. It's people all the time. They're like, oh, I've been running around all day. I'm in solving title issues. You know, I'm, I'm pushing deals forward. And like, yes, that's true. You are pushing deals forward because no one else is there to do it. But solving title issues is not really that productive. Um, unless your job's a TC. So TCs, you can hire for way cheaper than your dollar per hour is worth. And it's just not not worth it and not production. It's not going to push your business forward. So we got to stop doing that. No days can be wasted on title issues. And then you have to learn how to work through work through people in this stage. So this is like a the first like leadership opportunity most um, entrepreneurs are going to have if, if you're in the wholesaling real estate space. Because 
the, this side of the business is kind of ambiguous and every situation is a little bit different because every deal is different. So you have to learn leadership skills to be able to work through people to be able to like have um, a result that doesn't require your input. So what I mean by that is when, you know, when I see people doing a lot to talk to a guy today again about this is he's like, you know, my TC, how would you grade him on a scale one to 10? You know, he said an eight and then I was like asking him more about it. And he goes, well, you know, the biggest problem we have with our TC is that, you know, she asks us a question and like, you know, it's kind of hard to train her because then we just go and solve the problem for her. And like, that's the wrong approach. And a lot of people do that because you're so used to pushing deals across the finish line. But what you have to do is you have to stop and you have to ask them questions and say, Hey, what do you think you should do about that problem? What would you do? And then either they have an answer that works or they have an answer that doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, then you just coach them up to come to their own solution so that you don't have to ever do it again. Because I mean, the key to delegation is being lazy and being a good coach. So you have to become a good coach and a good leader to empower people to go and do more and get uncomfortable because uncomfort, as you know, because you've gotten to the stage forces growth. So you have to do that in other people. You have to become a leader that's um, forcing other people to grow. And people are going to really, they're going to hate you in the moment, but they're going to love you in the future for it. So how do we do this? Let's delegate this out. The first thing we do is we need to document our money-making process. So basically, what does this mean? Um, a money-making process, and I'm going to pull this up. I got a template here for you guys of what a multi-seven-figure process looks like. But basically, it's going to be the same thing as this, just for the business itself. So right here, um, I'm just going to pull up. So this is the whole business from when we spend money to when we make money. But I'm going to pull up the Dispo TC one because I think this is the most valuable one for you guys um, based on what we're talking about right here. And we just documented out, you know, who does it based on the box, the color of the boxes, and then like what's done. So you can see here, that for this is Dispo on the top and this is TC on the bottom. There's a process for both. So we have a process for what happens throughout the uh, contract sign. So you can see like we got clear title, we got to send the VC to the attorney, um, funding for transactions, schedule closing, approve closing documents, and boom, that's it. And then we can see if there's bad title, what do we do if there's probate? What do we do if there's eviction? And we have that documented. So people know exactly what to do when there's something happens. It's automatic. Then A to B, um, sorry, A to B contract signs. This means a seller agreement signed. Um, we ordered the listing uh, sheet so we can put on the MLS. There's an aligned meeting with the acquisitions manager and the, and the dispo rep um, going over these things so we know what's going on. We have a seller intro call. We have a first property visit um, that we set up. Then we have a seller aligned call with the property visit, letting them know what's going on. Then we have an underwriting process. Then we go and market the process for interested buyers. Then we get RSVPs scheduled. So we have people who are going to the showing, then we facilitate the walkthrough and we get, you know, all, all the things. So this is basically how we go from basically doing retrades. If, if we, if we need to get a retrade, if we don't need to get a retrade, um, how do we list it? How do we market it? How do we get buyers? How we do all that? And how do we get to closing day? And this is all step-by-step. Step. So now the people know, the people on our team know exactly what to do um, to finish the process. Cause their job is to take a contract from an AB being signed to closing day. And they know what their role is in that. So you have to document this for your team because otherwise there's going to be no way that they actually know what's going on. Um, so that's critical. The other part to this is as you delegate this out, you're going to need to learn what's called asset management. And not to like the deepest degree, but you're going to need to know how do you manage the pipeline of deals you have at a glance? Because you can't be sitting there and just reading for hours and hours and hours about all the notes, like forcing your team to put down a million notes in, in the sales force and all this kind of stuff. You have to do it off a few things. So this is how I set up the CRM. It's for Dispo. I have statuses for literally our properties and transactions. Uh, and I, I know on the last one, I talked about a couple uh, different statuses, but this goes way deeper. That was to get you step one. Um, this gets you to step two and, and really dialing in the Dispo process. Another thing I wanna note is the only reason we know this is because we actually had to scale a dispo department to multiple dispo representatives. Most people in wholesale don't even have dispo reps or acquisition managers do it, or they rely on agents or they do it themselves. So like they're select few buyers. So to, to, to make this very blunt, we've had to do this at a high scale where we have 40 deals in escrow at any given time at all times. So this works at scale to where past where most people are going to go. And I'd suggest most people go. So anyways, dispo CRM, how does it set up? So the status is just like a seller lead, you got new status, get deal on hold. 
heel and hold basically just means that we can't do anything in dispo. We're not like maybe it's a, a a bad title. Maybe a clear title first. Then we got uh, new properties. A, a second one. Um, then we got pending pictures. So this basically means we're we we are waiting on pictures. Then we got underwriting period means we we got pictures back and now we're waiting on underwriting. Pending marketing means that we're waiting on it to go out to marketing um, and like to get lists in the MLS or send out the email blast or the text blast or whatever. Then we have the walkthrough period. This means it's being marketed and now we're setting up walkthrough. Once we're done with that, the reason it leaves walkthrough period is because we found a buyer and the buyer's in inspection period because a lot of times we sell deals with uh, due diligence, especially on the MLS. And then we know buyers are post inspection and then we know we closed one or we canceled lost. And that's how we manage these at a, at a glance. So really quickly, the way that I'm doing this, and I'll actually talk about it much deeper down here on the uh, three parts to asset management, but I'm able to like manage like what, like deals and underwriting period. There should never be deals there who are not finalized underwriting period. That's just like a complete waste. Like why would we not move that deal faster? Because what Dispo's job and TC's job is, it's a, it's a revenue maintenance center. The job is to make sure that we don't lose revenue that we are accounted for. So if we lock up a deal and we're like, yeah, we're gonna make 30K, we wanna make sure we make at least 30K on that deal as a dispo department and that we're not canceling deals that we shouldn't cancel. The only deals we shouldn't cancel are priced way too high, um, in my opinion. And if that's the case, then you know that's okay. That's, that's, that is what it is. But dispo's job is to get every deal to the finish line as fast as possible. So it's a time thing here. It's a huge time thing. <laughs> TC, same thing. Um, here's how we set it up. New, new deal. Title issues. Okay, great. We're stuck in title issues. Um, title issues can market. Basically, that means that there are title issues, but they'll be solved before we close. Um, title issues, nothing else means it's like probate or something really long that don't market it. Uh, title clean means that it's clean title. Payoff requested, payoff received, set up closing, clear to close, uh, close one, memo filed, canceled, lost. Pretty basic stuff. Payoff requested, payoff received. Um, set up closing. I mean, these are pretty straightforward stuff, right? So uh, once once everything's clear to close, that means that we're good to go and we can move the deal up or whatever we need to do. But this is very basic of how we organize all of our stuff. So every, every uh, we call it a transaction, every property that we have under contract has this Dispo CRM set up and then TC CRM set up. So they both have two statuses on them. So now that we have those set up, we, we can properly manage uh, each property and we can execute this asset management play. So there's really three parts to asset management. You have managing future cash, we have creating future revenue, and we have limiting downside and maximizing upside. So those are the three main things. All right, so let's dive into managing future cash. Um, basically what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the numbers below this on the last Monday of like, let's just say January. So we're, we're ending January. We're going to look at, so like basically if I was to look at the calendar for this week, I would have looked at this on the 25th. Okay. And then I also would have looked at this on the Monday, the second week. So I would also look at this on the 8th. So it's essentially like every other week, um, basically every two weeks, I'm going to be monitoring these numbers that are below this. And this is so I can get a good feel for what my revenue looks like um, from a, from a high level because I'm managing cash and cash flow. So basically what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at this month's signed revenue. So like how much of buyer um, post inspection do I have? And then like I can look at individual deals for inspection period, but guarantee, not guarantee, but almost guaranteed close is buyer post. I'm going to look and see how much do we have closing in February, not this month, but February. Then I'm going to look at this month's possible cash. So basically I'm going to go through and say, okay, well, walkthrough period and buyer inspection period. How much do I have that is likely to close this month? Because I know it takes us about 30 days once we're listed to actually close. Actually, it's a little bit longer. It's like 45 days once we're listed to actually close. So I look at these, I'm like, okay, how much do I actually think is possible? Then I have an idea. If if my, this month's signed revenue, so I'm looking in January, but if February's revenue that is already signed and accounted for is less than break even, then I need to really figure out how to push and push some other deals forward. Um, otherwise, I just feel confident that, like, oh yeah, we're gonna make good money this month. And that's how it should be. Otherwise you need to sign some, you know, we'll talk about what, what to do if not. Then I'm gonna look at this month's possible cash. So let's just say that I have this month's sign is $50,000 and then possible is 25K. I have one more deal that's possible. So that means best case scenario, I make 75K this month. Uh, worst case scenario, hopefully it's only 50. Um, and that's that. Then I'm going to look at the March's, so I'm in January, I'm looking at March's uh, signed cash. So that way I can model out and say, okay, 
February has got this already signed. March has got this already signed. And then I know what I can, what I need to generate from a acquisition side and also from a dispo side, what I need to sell and where I need to put my energy. So then I can look at next month's possible cash for March. And I'm, I have a really good understanding of like, okay, next month we have 20 K already signed to close. And then we have another hundred K that's possible. And then now I know, okay, I'm going to make about X number of dollars based on my, my projection. And that's how you can really understand what your cash flow looks like and how you can start to make investments in your business by not actually knowing every deal all the way through. Then this allows me to plan for low cash months. Um, if I have a low cash month for February, then I'm asking every single deal, I'm going through every single transaction. Can we close this? Can we close on this property sooner? Can the acquisitions team lock up more wholesale opportunities where we can sell them quick? Can or should I fire sell any of these properties to make a little bit less money, but make money sooner? Um, I need to consult with the finance team to understand cash flow constraints um, with the things that I found about these properties. So like, and you're the, gonna be the finance team for a lot of you guys who are listening, but you can go look at it and be like, can I float a lower month where I don't make but five grand this month or lose 10 grand or make only 20 or what, whatever the number is, it's like, well, can I do that? Is that, is that scenario okay? Can I float that from a cash flow perspective? And if you can, then don't do anything. But if you can't, then you need to maybe fire sell some properties or you need to really like go hard on getting some revenue. And you got to be ahead of the eight ball and be proactive and not be reactive. Because what happens to a lot of people is they become reactive and they don't realize that they actually don't have any cash coming in and they're losing money. And then they turn off their marketing. And then this creates a couple months of a lull until they make more money. And then when they make more money, they turn back on marketing and then they don't make any money and then they got to turn it off again. That's what creates the up and downs and why we need to manage our cash effectively. So you have to manage your cash right in this business. Otherwise, you're going to uh, potentially put yourself in a sticky situation, especially as you scale. Then plan for next month's low cash. It's going to be a lot of the same things. Um, you know, question would be like, should we turn some flips into wholesales? So instead of flipping them, should we just wholesale them and get them off? Um, also consulting with the acquisitions team on how we can overcome this issue of having like you know, a low month in March and like, what can they do to push deals over? Like, is there any creative follow-up marketing tactics they can use, whatever it might be. And so you really want to get clear on this and be proactive and working ahead of time. You don't want to be halfway through the month of January and then being like, damn, dude, we're not going to make money this month. Cause then you're, you're definitely not going to make money. You want to be halfway through December and looking in January and be like, okay, January is going to be tough. We got to start doing stuff now in order to put revenue on the board. So you want to be proactive, not reactive. Then part two is creating future revenue. So creating future revenue, there is a few different problems with this. So we need to manage problem properties. This is mostly like pipeline management too, but how do we create future revenue? It's like managing problem properties and pushing them forward, moving the pipeline up and then uh, moving resources around and focusing on better opportunities, better, you know, the 80, 20 um, on your deals versus like deals that are really bad. So I'll talk about each one. So managing problem properties. So, you're going to be working through people on this, but helping people work through title issues. So what's the title issue? Like, What's the actual problem we're trying to solve? This, this, and this. Okay, well, would the escrow company say that need to be done? Okay, well, do we have this kind of, can we solve it this way or whatever? And you're going to be helping solve problems and push deals done. There's been like, there was a time, one time when we double, we, we bought a property and we closed on it at one title company. Then we were turning around and selling it three weeks later to someone else. Um, and the new closing attorney is a different closing attorney said that the title's dirty and like, we don't have clear title and we can't close for like two months cause we got to clear it. And like, it was just such a simple situation where it's like, Hey, we just closed this, just get the title, the title policy or whatever the, you know, the actual name of it is and send it to the new, the, from the old closing attorney to the new one. And then that pushed the deal forward and we made 30 K and what seemed like could have not, not happened. Like you guys know these problems and you just have to help your TC or whoever you're working through solve it. You can't go and do it for them. You have to have them do it, but you help them uh, through that through that process. I'm working through seller issues. So like seller wants to back out, role play it with the person who's the point of contact for the seller. Don't go talk to the seller, role play it. And then have the, that person go and do it and then congratulate them when they did it and they completed it. Because these things can be solved by other people. It's just a limiting belief in your mind that you need to go and solve it. The last thing, helping work through any, uh, any, any compromising deals. So basically... Um, anything compromising deals. So like this could be maybe um, time. It's like, how do we uh, get an extension 
uh, maybe like the house is flooded and it's just really random, but it's like could compromise a deal. Basically these random scenarios that, that come up because that's how real estate works is like it rains for a little, a couple of weeks and then the house floods because the roof's bad. So how do we solve these problems? And it's your job to help coach your team to solve these problems so that you don't ever like, eventually what's going to happen is your team's just going to solve it and tell you what they did. And you're going to be like, damn, that was really smart. I'm glad you did. Um, and then you're not going to have any stress about it because you're a good leader. But what's going to happen is if you're not a good leader is you're just going to grab the baton from them and you're going to go and solve it or you're going to bark orders at them and tell them what to do. And then they're never going to do anything on their own. And they're going to just wait for you. And that's, that's what I see a lot of times happen. So you've got to make sure you get good at working through people on the dispo side, because there's a lot of nuance and ambiguity. And you want to empower your team to make a good team. That also means you need a good team. Uh, number two, how do we move the pipeline forward? Basically, what we always have is a deal holdup. So the deal holdup is just like what's keeping the deal from moving forward right now um, and, and having a buyer on it or what's keeping it from closing sooner or whatever. And then you look at the next action to, that's going to push the deal forward and solve that deal holdup. And like basically, you just want to like see if they're aligned and like you're looking at it from a high level. And just like each property at a glance. And like, if those two make sense, you're like, okay, cool. That makes sense. Maybe you'll touch base if you see it like a couple of days in a row on there or whatever. But that's how we pretty much take a peek at everything. It's like, this is a very solvable problem and time can be collapsed here. And like, we need to do that. So basically like, <coughs> so, so basically what you're doing is you're looking at each property and you're saying, all right, what's the issue? Um, let's discuss this. Let's think about it. Let's talk about solutions and then let's pick one. Let's move forward with it. And that's what you're doing for every single property, but you need to do it at a glance, which is why you have to have that deal hold up and the next action thing, and also have those statuses so you know where it's at. Um, number three is moving resources to certain properties. So the big thing I see here is like a lot of times dispo reps or transaction coordinators like see all deals equal. But in reality, like a 50K deal needs more attention than a 5K deal. And you have to make sure you constantly like reassess like your pipeline and say, what's the best opportunity for us to spend our waking hours to produce revenue for this week? Because at the end of the day, the, the job of Dispo is to make sure that the cash flow is being managed properly and that we're hitting our cash targets. So in order to do that, we have to say yes to some properties and say no, no to others. And that's just the reality of it. So you have to be good at redirecting resources around so that you're focused on the 80-20. Then limiting downside and maximizing the upside. This is, and guys, this is like kind of all boring, tedious shit. But if you want to learn how to grow a good, op, build a good operation, this is the stuff you need to know. So limiting downside and maximizing the upside. All right. So this is really important. Buying properties. Because if you're going to wholetail or you're going to take down a property, you need to be good at risk management and risk adjusted returns. You need to understand these concepts. So it's like basically the concept of like, if I could wholesale it for 30 would I flip it for 45? Depending on the season, depending on the property, depending on your bandwidth, the answer is probably no for the most part. That 15 grand is not worth the extra headache of taking it down, flipping it, and uh, holding on for it for a long period of time. Because there's a lot of risk in that, right? So I'd ultimately want to be like making more like 55 or 60 um, versus like a 30K wholesale. 45 is kind of like borderline. It has to depend on a lot of circumstances. If we're in a good season, I would consider doing it. But if we're in a bad season, I definitely wouldn't do it. Also, if our bandwidth was really clear and we could easily handle it, I would I would do the 45 or the 30. But anyways, let's talk about this. Seasonality. Every season, and I'm going to pull up a little a little chart here. Every real estate season kind of looks like this. Here, let, me, let me draw better. It kind of looks like this. This is how real estate works in most markets. So this is the summer. So we got spring. So usually it's like, you know, March. And then usually this is like September or actually August is when it starts going down usually. So March to August is like pretty great. Usually what happens is October, people are like, oh my God, the market's so slow. And then people in, in, in March are like, oh my God, the market's everything's selling like crazy. And that's because from August to, to March, you're in this lull and everyone's like, oh my God, the market's crashing. I'm so uncertain. But in reality, this is just like the way cycles work. Go to your ML, your FMLS, go to your, or FMLS is what ours is called. Go to your MLS and look at the maps for median home price, days on market, whatever it is, months of supply. Every single time it looks like this. And this is just normal market cycles. Um, obviously with rates, that's going to artificially affect things. So like in June of 2021 or June of 2022, the market was kind of like this. And then it went poof, straight down. 
Um, that's what happened. And th this was felt like this was like really steep, especially for a lot of people. But that's because rates were, were going to go up and like everyone knew that was going to happen. So you just had to be paying attention. Um, so seasonality, know when you're at where you're at and when you're going to be selling a property. So, okay, let's say, let's say you're buying a property in August, knowing that the market's going like this, should you overpay? Un should you be conservative or optimistic about the price selling higher or lower than what you want it to be? Well, you should think the price is going to go lower than what you see comps are at. That's just guaranteed pretty much in most markets, not every market, but if the market's going has historically trended downwards, what projection, what, what, what direction are prices going to go down? Okay. So know that you buy an AUG and you're going to wholesale it and it's going to sell. August is going to be prep. September is going to be listed. October is going to sell. Maybe November is going to sell. So you're going to sell in October or November, which is going to be significantly lower than it is in August. So that means you need to be conservative in your pricing, which means I'd probably drop it 5% depending on what market you're in. That's what Atlanta looks like. Now that's one option. The other option, which I think is very uh, good to talk about, is let's say you're buying it in March. If I'm buying a property in March and the properties, the prices are going like this, what should I what should I think? Should I think prices are going up, down, or lower? Well, I would probably assume that if I'm buying it in March, prep it in March, sell it in April, and then close in May. Close in May. So if I'm closing in May, um, based on the market and the way that things have been trending. It's probably going to be a little higher than I anticipate, right? Than than what I comp it in March. So if I comp in March, it's probably going to be a little bit higher in May. Now, would I that mean I'm overpaying in March to lock it up and sell it in May? No, I'm never going to do that. I'm only buying it for what it's worth, and I'm buying it for less than what it's worth if the market's going down. So that's really really critical because that's how you manage risk. And so what happens is when you think you're going to make 60k um, in this scenario, you actually make 70k. And then what happens in the other scenario when you buy it in August and sell it in November is you think you're going to make 60K, but you really make 45 or 50K. Four, uh, it's four, 45. Because you really make 45K. We had it in June last year. We had deals, um, or June of last year. It is technically last year, 2022. In 2022, June, we had deals where we thought we were going to make like 80 to 100K, literally. And then we ended up on this one deal. We showed it to 63 walkthroughs and we made $5,800, which means we lost money. <laughs> um, but that's what we net. That's what we technically netted. We, we didn't do very good on that one. Um, so that is a huge difference, right? And the reason for that is because the level of product, th this was way more supply. So it means you have to have a better product that sells um, to sell for a high price. And if we're wholetailing, you're selling a pretty subpar product. So you got to be really in tune with what the actual market looks like. Um, so supply and demand. That's what we're doing. We, we own a business and we're running a business that is ran by seasonality and supply and demand. So I'd always recommend building a best, worst, and probable outcomes. So like in this scenario where you're buying it and selling it in May, if you're selling in May, it's a good month in general to sell it. If you think you're going to make 60, definitely no way you're making less than 50. And you, you, know, you hope if things go well, you'll make 70. If you're in August and you're selling, sorry, if you're selling it in, a, in let's just say November, then you, you, you want your downside to be like guaranteed that you're definitely like, there's like, you're like, I could fire sell this thing and make 30. If you could do that, then it's likely you'll make 45 and best case you'll make six, something like this, right? This is how I like to look at it. But I always like to look at what's the least I'm going to make. And like, am I comfortable with that risk? Because I think like there's a good chance I make 45 or 60. Um, but I know the least for sure I'd be very confident to say the least I'm making 30 because if you, if you're going to make, if you're getting any closer than that, then there's just a small slip up and something you're not accounting for will, will result in an L on the balance sheet. You don't want to earn the profit and loss. You don't want to do that. So my rule of thumb for any, any deal I'm taking down is to make 20% on it. So you need to make 20% on your sale price. So if you're selling it for 300 K, you need to make 60 K on it. That needs to be your, your probable outcome is 60 K profit. Okay. Um, so that's really important to know because I've seen a lot of people get burned by making less than that. Um, need cash now, basically like, do you need, if you need the cash right now, then it's probably not wise for you to go and, uh, try to wholetail this. So you need to be okay with waiting a little bit longer for your cash, but you also need to be okay with knowing that you're going to make more, um, it's just going to take longer and there's more risk with it. And you're trading in anytime you, you buy a property, you're also going to spend more time and more resources on that. 
and it's going to take a little bit more of your brain space just because these are the first times you're doing this. It's not going to be autopilot. It also adds complexity because anytime you're doing a new process for the first time, it just adds complexity. Now, once you've done a handful of wholetails, you, you should have the, the infrastructure to do it pretty seamlessly and pretty easy. Um, these are going to be boots in the ground. It's going to be your cleaning crew getting pictures in there um, and, and like your clean out crew and also going to be your lenders. So you need to make sure that you're getting really dialed in. That. So if you have private money, you're going to be setting yourselves in a good position. The way to get private money is partner with a flipper on a wholetail and just give them half the deal, but get their private money lender. Um, and make sure you vet that they're actually a legit private money lender <laughs> um, before you just do that. But that's how we got ours. And I'd recommend it. Um, exit strategies. So limiting downside and maximizing upside. I think, you know, to this point is what Buffett says is like never lose money. That's like the rule. So never do a deal where you're like, eh, it's kind of like I either make 15 or I lose 15. Don't do that. It's either I either make a decent amount of money, like 20, 30 minimum, like worst case fire sell scenario, or I make like 60 or 70. So make sure that's really critical because those 60, 70 rips are going to be huge for you, but those L's are going to be huge for you in the wrong way. All right. Exit strategies. Which ones can we have to maximize our upside? Wholesales. If you need cash soon, wholesale it. If you don't need cash soon, find a way to have a wholetail um, and go from making 20, 25, 30 to making 60 plus um, flip. We don't do a lot of flips. We've done some, um, not a huge flip guy. Uh, I think it's solid. I think sometimes that it makes sense based on the areas and the deals to flip over wholetail. Um, that's just the reality of it because sometimes wholetailing doesn't make more sense than a wholesale and you got to look at it from all angles, but generally speaking for 10, for 10 or 15 K I'm going to wholesale it every day over wholetailing it in general, in most, most scenarios, unless it's like, yeah, in, in most scenarios, that's what I do. If it's 15 K it's close. If it's 10 K it's guaranteed a wholesale, um, flips we have to put more than like, let's call it 15 K in the house. Um, you know, you need to make a good amount more. You need to, you need to get a good return on that money you're putting into the property. Rentals know you're giving typically people who buy rentals buy their own wholesale deals as rentals, know what you're giving up and know your cash. You're not going to get rich off rentals um, from a cash flow perspective. And this is really a wealth play. Um, so it is good to buy rentals. I don't think that that's wrong. I just think be know what impact that's going to have on the business and what kind of distraction it's going to cause from the business. Cause I know a lot of people who buy rental portfolios and rentals suck. Honestly, I hate rental uh, personally. <laughs> they, they just are, are complete trash and um, you know, they're good wealth plays, but it's annoying. So not, not a super big fan of them, but anyways, uh, just know what that's going to cause you. It's going to, it's whether you like it or not, it's going to cause you brain damage. Um, seller carry and flip. So this is like a, basically like a, you know, I think what Pace calls it like a, uh, sub to sub tail or something like that, where you do a owner finance or sub, uh, sub two and you, you flip it. That's an option. I've ne never done one of those. Um, the novation. So this is going to be like MLS strategy. Um, also you could do another one where it's like a novation MLS strategy, a novation plus a flip. And that would be another option. Um, this one's a little bit risky. We've only done this once and we've done minor repairs other times, like less than like a couple grand where it's really minor stuff. Most of the time we like to put any kind of flip work on the HUD um, for the buyer. Yeah, we were not taking that risk. The only times you might have to take that risk is like an HVAC or a roof or a deck where it's not going to get financing. So that's really important. Uh, but these are the extra strategies you can have. Um, and, you know, you want to be able to leverage a select few that you're really good at. Um, if you're virtual, like I think the best way to scale a company is going to be through going into multiple markets, having few very dialed in exit strategies, but having like less complexity in marketing channels. So like going deeper in, in marketing, like staying true to a few marketing, a couple, one or two marketing channels, maybe max three, but doing multiple of the best markets with lots of buyers. And then you can execute a few of your good strategies. So maybe it's like wholesales, wholesales, innovations. And that's like your, that's your repertoire. Um, so anyways, so how do I train someone when every situation is different? I talked about this a little bit, but have a process documented. Like I showed, um, basically train the rest as it happens. You got to be able to work through people 
read read some books. The Dichotomy of Leadership, fantastic book. Read The Multipliers. Read Five Dysfunctions of a Team. These books are really, really good. Read Good to Great. All these books are fantastic on teaching you how to do be a good leader. Um, basically, general rule of thumb is, let's say someone brings me a problem. Um, I ask, well, what do you think you should do in this scenario? And they answer, I think I should do this. If the answer is good, then say, okay, I like that solution. When are you going to have that done? Super easy. If the answer is okay, then basically ask them, have you thought about X, Y, Z problem? And this will show them like a gap in their solution that they'll fix and be like, oh, that's a good point. I should fix that. And if their answer is bad, just ask them like roughly, like, okay, well, what were you thinking about when you came to the solution? And then they give you an under, uh, understanding of their baseline knowledge. And then you can coach them to fill the gaps in so they can much easier, you can much easier like fill their gap of knowledge where, they, where they're missing to solve the problem the right way. And when you give them that knowledge, they should be like, oh, the solution is pretty obvious. And the big thing is you want to coach people up to solve these problems and not solve it for them. So you never want to be the answer giver because if you're the answer giver, then you're going to be the life prefer- preserver forever for them. And they're always going to come to you. Um, number five. What KPIs should I track for Dispo and TC? So for me, what I like is percent of target profit is the main one. That's the key metric because that's a profit. Dispo is a profit maintenance center, not a profit center. Granted, you can get price reductions. You can do that. And that can be profit. And I have that lower down. But it's a profit maintenance center. That's critical for you to understand. Because you'll make money on the acquisition, not on the disposition. If you are a big real estate guy and you're like a developer, do land, a flipper, you can be really creative and can make money on the disposition side. But generally speaking, you know what you're buying on the acquisition side and you know you have a deal. So my my two cents. So another one would be days for new signed property to sign with a buyer. We want to be quick. That, that cash conversion cycle is king. Um, we want to know what it is so we can project out the business the right way. Um, and we can also keep it tight so we have less risk and we have quicker cash. Um, cancellation rate. Basically, um, we want to know the cancellation rate of deals that are not due to bad pricing by acquisitions. That's going to be critical because we should never, my expectation is we should never flounder a deal on Dispo that was a management issue or a communication issue with the seller. Most people, most reason the deals get canceled is because their communication with the seller is not as frequent as it should be. When you're, when you're communicating with sellers on a Dispo side, you need to talk to them literally like every week minimum, at least once a week. Um, another one is going to be added revenue from price reductions. So this is a profit center metric because there is some profit generated by, by Dispo. And, um, yeah, buyers added, if you're doing off market, um, that's a really good one, um, just to stack in there. And then if you're doing for TC, like lines of credit, liquidity of lenders at all times, someone has to do it. It's going to be the owner at most, at most of the time, but then the TC is going to like manage and continue that, um, that, that phase so they can get the funding. Um, another thing too is going to be uh, not only just line of credits, but also um, closings on time. So basically like for TC, we have the closing date is August 31st. Do we close before or on August 31st? That's just like a timely cash on, cash conversion number, but that's a TC metric that we like. So Dispo, I went deep into this. I've never really made too many videos on Dispo because I feel like a lot of people don't have that problem, but if you're actually going to scale your business to multiple... Uh, you know, to seven figures a year, multiple six figures a month, you need to have this dialed in. If you want to hit 100K per month and not lose your brain, if you want to travel the world, you want to do all those fun things, you got to do that. All right, let's get to pillar five, building a legit business. Um, This is my, this is what I'm most passionate about um, is one, pillars one to four are about getting you out of the business, right? We got to do this so we can get ourselves out of the business, out of the day to day, over top, so we can actually grow this thing. Um, So pillar five is about growing it. And the things that we need to do in order to grow it. So number one is we need quarterly planning in place. So what does what do I mean by quarterly planning in place? So let me walk you through this. Basically, um, it all starts, in my opinion, having a plan for how you're going to make a certain amount of revenue. So if I'm, my name is Chandler. If Chandler LLC wants to do $1 million a year um, in 2024 or 2025 or whatever year it is, then here's what I need to do is I need to get my baseline metrics for my leads, my appointments, my offers. I'll just change this to offers. And then my contracts and my sold deals and my average deal size. So let me just put a scenario that's pretty common. Um, $20,000 for average deal size, closing 75% of deals, um, 20%, yeah, 25% close rates. Perfect. Um, th- this is like a good, this is a good, uh, good numbers right here. 
these are uh, these are rough numbers that are pretty accurate across the board. Um, and let's just say that you know this is a solid business that operates. So you've figured out how to actually become a wholesaler. You you've become good at this, and this is what you do on a monthly basis. Let me add down here your marketing expenses, um, just so you we have them. Probably spend about five thousand dollars a month on marketing, or give or take. You know maybe it's three grand, but whatever, somewhere in this neighborhood. Um, and we're closing one to two deals a month. So we're doing about 30K in this scenario. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to map this out. If I want to hit a million bucks, I draw out, this is what I do right now. So right now I'm making a quarter mil a year. Um, and you know, like some of these numbers are going to be higher. This is 50%. So if I was to go, let me just get a hundred um, for a couple of these. Okay, this gets it up to 75. Boom, boom. Okay, there we go. So now we're at 79%. That's probably pretty accurate for most people. So we're at 380K. So this is 30K a month on the dot, basically. Um, 40K some months, 20K some months. It's going to be give or take. We're spending 5K a month in marketing, um, which basically equals out to, you know, what is that? 5 times 12 is 60K. 60K a year in marketing spend. So this is our numbers. So if I want to map out and hit a million, I want to project over by 25%. And if I'm doing that, then what I need to do is I need to come here and figure out how much money I'm going to make likely in Q1. Um, and basically, I'm going to map out the entire year. So if I think I can do three contracts, I can do four contracts here. Let me let me turn this back. Um, four contracts here. Um, and I think I can maybe do like four every month from here. And this is like something that I think is very possible. Okay, cool. So if I scaled up, I'm going to need to spend a little bit more on marketing. So let's just say I'm just, you know, my, my cost per deal is $2,500. So to get an extra deal, uh, or an extra contract, I need to spend 2,500 bucks. Um, I need to spend 10K here. Okay, now I can spend 10K a month. And then now I'm spending 112 grand and I'm making 780. So it's pretty, pretty honestly really good ROI. Uh, it's probably someone doing like cold call or something like that. Um, Cause this is really solid. So, it, and I also, oh wait, I also have these 75s. Okay, yeah, that's way better. Okay, so this is much, makes much more sense. So like your ROI on this is, Six, six X, right? So that's pretty good. That means you have a solid business. You're, you're running things really efficiently. You're probably doing cold calling and you probably need to hire some people out. So let's keep getting the math, right? We got to get to a million. So if I want to keep scaling up to a million, um, I'm probably gonna have to build some infrastructure for two months. So then I'm going to, you know, map out. Okay. Let me, let me map out this and go a little higher over the summer. Um, nothing really changed too much. Let me, let me just get this six and then five and then four. Okay, cool. So now we're here. We're at 750K. We're going to have to increase our marketing again, another another good amount. Oh, but that's 125,000. That's way too much. 15K. And then I'll just keep scrolling that out. And then until five. And then you're just going to probably keep this uh, marketing spend up at 15. And then what will likely happen is maybe you'll hit five and five. And then like four or something like this. And then now what we can do is be okay so our deal size is 20 let's say we wholetailed some maybe our deal size is, um so then we just map this out and over the summer things are higher and then we drop back down so now we're at 870 we're getting closer um so re in reality what we need to do is we need to either figure out like hey is there other ways i can increase my deal size can i get the 30k is that possible in my market um can i spend more money on marketing at these um at these numbers so maybe it's like okay i'm spending 15k let's spend 20k in this month um and see what that does for me I'll spend 20K the rest of the year. If I spend 20K, I should go to like seven, maybe eight. And then maybe it's like six, six, um, five, something like that. And that gets me really close to a million. And now you can start to see how we're projecting this out. And so we have the math working. So I want to project 25% uh, percent over um, a million. So I want 1.25 is like my ideal number. But I also want you to project and know like roughly like what's actually doable. And, you know, let's just say the deal size stays up and then we hit a million. Maybe we hit a couple months with 30 um, in the summer, because we have bigger deals, maybe we have some uh, some wholesales that close, and that puts us at one point one. So right there, this is kind of like what we'd see as a goal in a, in a roadmap. So this is step one. So let's determine like what our actual numbers need to look like, and what our marketing expenses need to look like. So we need to spend one hundred seventy five k to make one point one point one million, which is a six x ROI, um, which means that we might need to spend a little bit more money than that, but roughly somewhere in that neighborhood. So that's step one. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to come here and we're gonna go through this planning doc. Um, on this planning doc, I basically map out everything you need from core values 
to your mission statement, to your niche, your three differentiators, your proven marketing processes, like just how do you make money, customer guarantee, your business review. So you're going to go through what's working right now, all different areas. So you can double down that. What's not working, marketing, lead management, acquisitions. Um, these basically will go on an issues list that I'll show later. Um, and then basically you'll solve these for, for later issues because they're, they're important things that are not working that need to be fixed. Um, then we'll do like a last quarter, last year review. Like, did we reach our goal? No, we didn't. What are some reasons why we missed it? And then what do we learn and what are we planning to do differently this year to hit the goal? And if we did hit the goal, of course, you want to know why you hit it. And like, what'd you do? That was the big lever that really pulled it. And so this is a learn, this is like the learning phase, right? And then this is the identifying of what, what was wrong. Um, then the business planning goal. So basically you want to get really clear on your three-year plan. So map out a future date. What's the revenue look like? What's the profit it look like? What are some measurables? How many, you know, what is like your business? What do you want it to look like? Are you trying to do developments? You're trying to do new constructions? You're trying to flip? You're trying to, whatever it is. Like what, what does your measurable look like? How many of these are you trying to do? What does your business look like? How much are you working? What is your involvement? All like what's your team look like? Just get clear on this vision because if you're clear on this vision, then it's going to change the way that you're going to um, interface with a one year and 90 day plan, right? Because you're going to do different things today if your three year plan is different, right? If it's really achievable, then you're not going to change much today. If it's really out there, you're going to have to change a lot. And so that's really important. Then you need to get clear on your one-year goal. So what's your revenue? What's your profit? What's your rough measurables? Like how many leads? How many appointments? How many offers? How many contracts? How many deals? What's your average deal size? How many flips? How many wholesales? How many this? How many that? What's your goals for the year? Like what do you have to accomplish this year in order to hit that? There's usually going to be a few things um, that you have to do in order to hit that that, that one-year goal. So maybe that's like open up a new market. Maybe that's a new marketing channel. Maybe that's scale in the PPC. Maybe that's higher in acquisitions, whatever it is, it, you need to put it here and be clear on it and know what you want to accomplish for the year. So you're visualizing all this stuff. Then your 90 day plan. Um, this is where you get clear on your revenue, your profit for the quarter. Like what's your goal? So we mapped out like what we think quarter one is going to be here. So we need two, three, four each month. We're going to do 40, 40, 60, um, these months. And, that's basically going to put us at making, I don't know, a hundred grand over the quarter. Let's say that's what the number is. So that's, that's awesome. We're also going to do, um, 140 K in, in revenue. So we want to make hundred K. We probably made like 70, 70, 75, something like that. We do 140. What are the measurables for the quarter? How many leads, how many appointments, how many offers, that kind of stuff. Then quarterly theme, every quarter has a theme. So it's like, maybe it's get better. Maybe it's document. Maybe it's stay true to what works. Maybe it's keep it simple whatever your theme is. Um, and that's going to be like how you like approach this quarter from a one line message. It's going to really help with messing, sending that to your team as well as being clear on that yourself. Then this is going to allow us to do a rock idea dump. Um, and basically this is where we actually take this math and we make it into reality. So to basically achieve these numbers for this quarter and then for the rest of the year, what kind of things do we need to put in place for marketing right, right, right now? What kind of things do we need in place for lead management? What kind of things do we need in acquisitions, dispo, TC, finance, ops, whatever it is. And then list it all out. And then you're going to get clear on what's like a, an achievable, like long-term goal. That's like a, like a long-term to do. That's like a big thing. And that's going to be like a rock. Then short things that are just going to need to be done right now to push the business forward. That's like a to-do. And you're just going to basically have all these to-dos and all these rocks. And I, I suggest somewhere between two and five rocks maximum. Ideal is like three, maybe four max, um, but two to five maximum, two minimum, five maximum rocks that are done over the quarter. And these need to be just like big long-term tasks. So this could be building out an apartment, hiring someone that's a performing sales rep, whatever it is. It needs to be something that's like big lever that's gonna you're going to be really happy with. That It's not going to make an impact this quarter, but it'll make an impact next quarter and all the quarters beyond. Then basically just select the rocks, owner name, your name, that kind of stuff. Um, then we have all these issues from the what's not working page. And basically we're going to go through each issue and we're going to mark out, all right, what's important um, or like, what's the actual issue? What's the actual problem we're solving? Um, what are the things that we can do to solve this problem? And then we create to do's to solve those problems. And then that's it. And then we just create to do's, remove issue, create to do's and remove issue over and over again. So we have no more issues and we have a bunch of, you're going to leave this meeting at this point with a lot of clarity and a lot of action items. 
And that's going to put you on a really good path for the next 30, 60, 90 days to move in the right direction. Then you just make sure you implement the stuff. So all the measurables need to be broken down monthly, weekly, daily, and then all the new KPIs for team members need to be given to everyone. So if there's a change in the amount of appointments people need to set, whatever it is, they need to be given out to everyone. Then we need to communicate with everyone on the team. They need to know the goal and how they contribute. All the daily scorecards should be updated with new metrics. So you run daily huddles. Everyone's like paying attention to that and being held accountable to new numbers and new metrics. If that's applicable, it's not always applicable. Um, all weekly scorecards are updated to match new metrics. So like your, your, your business review meetings, all that kind of stuff. You have new measurables on there. All your rocks need a plan. So like you plan your, let's say a rock idea for acquisitions is to hire an acquisitions rep who's performing. Well, what's the plan for how you're going to do that? We're going to make it a job ad and you're going to do um, a bunch of discovery call interviews. You're going to build a hiring process. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to have an onboarding process. You have an ongoing training process. All that kind of stuff has to be built out. And that's the rock so that you can actually achieve that. So you can basically achieve your goals for May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. And that's why it's a rock because it builds the business. It doesn't make you money right now, but it builds it and makes you money later. So that's what's important. So at this point, you're ready to basically implement and rock and roll. And that's the most important part of quarterly planning. Then we have like a weekly L10 or business review structure. And that's what this is. So basically, you need to have installed in your business um, a weekly review process. So if you read the book Traction, a lot of this stuff comes from there. I've also paid other people to teach me like how they do it. Um, and, and it's all kind of the same, but it has its own big thing. So Basically, you're going to run a, every week a meeting where you're going to review your measurables, your rocks in the progress, the scorecard, your stop by report, whatever it is, your to do's, your issues, and all that kind of stuff. And basically, you're going to review the issues in the business, make sure all your measurables are on track. If they're not, it becomes an issue and you solve it. And then when it becomes an issue and you solve it, then you're able to basically push the business forward and make some real progress. But this is going to give you a really good pulse check on how the business is actually working. So you need to make sure you're doing this meeting. It's very simple. You literally just go through, um, I mean, there, there's a video on here, so you can kind of see it and watch it, but you literally just go through, read the measurables. Did you hit it? Yes. Okay, great. No. All right. Issues list. Why did we not hit it? What was the problem? All right. How do we solve that? Create a to do and then do that. And then over and over again for everything. Um, and that's how you do the weekly review meeting. Um, that should be 90 minutes. If you're doing it by yourself, it might be a little bit shorter, like four, like 30 to 60 minutes. I'd set an hour apart every, every week if you're by yourself. <laughs> The people on that meeting should be on your leadership team. The decision makers who are pushing the business forward is how I describe that. Then we need to do daily huddles. And daily huddles are basically going to push forward all these weekly, monthly, quarterly goals um, and train your team as well. So basically the way that this works is you're going to have a 15 to 60 minute meeting with your um, actual people on your team going over good news, gratitude. That's how we start every meeting. Uh, KPI reviews, we're going to look at everyone's KPIs. What's their one number um, for them to have green days? Uh, what's their today activities or objectives that they're going to work on? Any training that needs to be had for those objectives? Then general training on the job for the remainder of the, uh, remainder of the time. Um, basically, the expectations for everyone is to be green every day. Um, you know, effort must be shown in order for outcome to follow. And it's super easy to um, to like let people slide and not be green. Just because you're like, oh, yeah, there was an excuse. There was this reason. There was this reason. But if someone has a red number for a day on their scorecard, meaning they didn't meet their KPI, then instead of like having a conversation with them right there on the call with all the other people, I find that really hard for me personally. Um, what I do is I call them after the meeting or at the end of the day or whenever, some other time that's like not relevant uh, exactly to that meeting. I just ask them like, hey, um, I know this, that, you know, your, you, your numbers have been read the last few days and I kind of just want to check in to see if there's anything that I can do to help. Um, and then just see what they say. If you're leading with help, they're going to answer you. They're going to be receptive of it. They're going to be like, I appreciate you reaching out, blah, blah, blah. And on this point, daily huddles are the most important part is this is where the leadership actually shines. And that's why I have recommended down here to read these five books or four books, excuse me, um, because they're going to help you with that circumstance where I just talked to you about and also how to become a good coach and work through people. So all these things that I've talked about in this thing, in this, uh, in this video, talking about automating dispo, building a sales process, training a team, blah, blah, blah. It all comes back to leadership. And if you want to build a good business that's profitable and people love to come to work with you, you need to become a great leader. So, all right. So we got all the boring business structure out of the way. We've talked about all the other things. Let's talk about building the team. So, 
here's how I see building a team is there's a few different phases. We have automated marketing, we have automated appointments, we have automated dispo TC, we have automated contracts. And that's how I see it. The reason why I see it this way is because this is the natural evolution of how people need to buy their time back. So automating marketing, that might be done if you're doing PPC with an agency, you're not involved, that might automatically be automated. Then your next step is going to be automating appointments. If you're doing inbound leads, appointments may not be the biggest bottleneck for you. And that's when you just skip right to Dispo TC. So most of the time, if people are doing inbound leads, they're already sitting in the automate the in the the role of the sales per uh, acquisitions person and the way that it works with inbound leads let me show you this this is how it works is if it wait with inbound so ib is you go this is leads and you go all the way to like you go straight acquisitions person so straight to am and the reason why you want to go straight to am is because they're going to actually convert those leads like we talked about and give them a good point of contact and you're not going to have that many like you, you know, there's a guy I talked to today. It's like one in 10 leads is a deal for him. So for him to do 10 deals a month, he only needs a hundred leads a month. That's like three a day. So anyone can, any acquisition manager can handle three a day. That's why inbound goes straight to acquisitions. So instead of going and hiring a lead manager, which here's what I talk about, um, you know, I'll go into all that stuff is you just want to hire a Dispo TC. So you can just hone yourself in the role of acquisitions and then automate everything else and then pull yourself out of acquisition. So let's talk about that. So for marketing, who to hire, um, once you're at 15K in revenue per month um, and or when you're basically wasting more than two hours a day on admin marketing tasks, that's when you want to hire a marketing person. Who? You want to hire an admin type person who can help you with all the other things, kind of like be your right hand, do data pulling, um, make sure like reports are done, all that kind of BS that like is annoying. They need to do all that. You need to do none of it. How do you do this? Upwork, Fiverr, online jobs at PH. There's staffing companies like Reva Global and some other people who I'd recommend as well. Automate appointments, um, basically, unless you're doing about marketing. <laughs> that, obviously, uh, then you skip it, as we talked about. When do you do this? Um, 15 to 30K a month. I would say if you're once you're around here, 15, 30K, you have enough profit to where it's easy to hire someone and be like, all right, um, let's bring someone in who can manage leads. It's probably going to be closer to 15K than it is 30 especially if you're doing cold call um, or if you're still able to do SMS at the time, um, that's falling off for sure. But that's going to be the range that you're going to want to hire a lead manager. Um, basically, whenever you're following up, the, the, the qualitative measurement is like when you're falling behind on your follow-up. Who do you hire? Lead manager to call all your follow-ups and, out, and do outbound uh, calls to all your new outbound leads, no inbound leads, so cold call or SMS. And then when they're really good, they can do inbound. So that's who they are. And then how do you find them if they're virtual, um, you know, these places so like, you know, if they're VA um, or Reva Global is a good option. If they're state high, state side, wise hire is a great option. Um, if you're going to post a job title, inside sales representative for real estate, automate Dispo TC. When do you do this? 30 to 50K a month. Once you're here, um, you typically have more than four deals in escrow at all times. And you're like, you're spending way too many times and like wasting days on title issues, on pushing deals forward, solving deal problems, all that kind of stuff. You need to solve this issue so that you can put your time, energy, and focus on acquisition. So you can go from 30 to six, 30 to 50K a month to like 60 to 100. And that's going to be huge for you. Who do you need to hire? Uh, dispo slash TC. How? Wise hire? Job title, disposition manager for real estate or transaction coordinator for Automate contracts. When? 50K per month. Um, you might be able to wait a little bit longer, but I see most people get capped at 50K per month um, because they're cherry picking appointments or they're not able to give all their best effort on appointment. So who are you hiring? Acquisition manager. How? Wise hire. Job title. Acquisition director for real estate. So that's how we scale is literally build a business execution system, which is these things right here, and then build a team to scale yourself out because ultimately if you want to scale is having other people do the tasks you used to do just as well as you did them, and now you don't do any of them. And that's how we scale from zero to 300K per month. It's by building a sustainable lead gen system, converting leads to appointments, building a repeatable sales process, automating Dispo and TC, and then ultimately scaling your business and building a true execution system. This will result in you making a lot more money just from taking um, time to execute the things in this video. So hopefully this is helpful. Send me a comment down below letting me know what was the most valuable piece for you. Thanks.